Hello and welcome to the humansinvent.com cycling podcast. My name is Richard Moore and today I'm joined by a new guest, Ed Pickering. Good afternoon, Richard. Thank you very much for joining us, Ed. Sadly, Lionel is on holiday this week, not in the Mauritius, as he said last week. He is on an island, but rather closer to home. The Isle of Wight. <laughs> the Isle of Wight. Um, and Daniel Freib is um, about to get the monkey off his back, the monkey, the Mark Cavendish-shaped monkey, and uh, will be rejoining the podcast next week, which is good news. Ed, normally Lionel describes where we are. Would you like to take on that honour today? Yeah, we're in the Chelsfield room at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall, the South Bank Centre. Um, we're being overlooked by the London Eye and the House of Parliament, where just last night MPs debated the state of cycling in the UK. So it feels rather apt that we're here. Yeah, absolutely. It's baking hot outside, so we're kind of receiving it. Maybe we should have done this in the London Eye. That would have been quite good. But it takes about quite, an hour to record, Quite appropriate it? for a Humans Invent podcast. I think so. Excellent. Right, let's crack on. Today we're going to be discussing the Vuelta the latest action there in Spain. Uh, we're also going to be talking, because we're joined by Ed, um, about his book, The Race Against Time, the story of the great Chris boardman Graham O'Brien rivalry in the 1990s. Um, and that leads us into a, a discussion about and with Graham O'Brien. We've got a short interview with Graham O'Brien about his forthcoming attempt on the world land speed record. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the our record itself and possible new challenges. And we've got a great competition to win copies of Charlie Wigelius' book, Domestique. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Right, Ed, well, we're watching stage 11 of the Vuelta, the time trial stage. We're watching Chris Horner lose the red jersey, the red leader's jersey. But he has really been the talk of the race so far. One, two stages, it's a, an especially mountainous Vuelta, of course. Horner is a, is a great climber. But he's also 41, which is unusual. First time he's ever led a Grand Tour. First time he's won a stage in a Grand Tour. So, so I think he's won a, uh, either Switzerland or Normandy. This is uh, late blooming, uh, quite unlike any we've seen before. Very late blooming. I mean, it's gras- gratifying on a, very, on a personal level, very gratifying, because he's older than me. <laughs> and uh, every time he does something, uh, has a, does, a, does an exploit, I feel like there is hope for me yet because uh, I'm I'm not as old as the people still doing well in cycling. I find that depressing rather than encouraging because I think I should be probably riding Grand Tours still at my youthful age. It's not too late, Richard. You're always telling us about your cycling prowess. Yeah, always, always. So yes, Chris Chris Horner, um, unusual career. Or no, it's not just the recent in recent in in 2010, I think it was. He he was at or around 10th or 11th place in the Tour de France. He's, he's done well in Grand Tours before. He came over to Europe in the late 90s and rode for FDJ, and it's fair to say he was like a fish out of water. He was a... Ponytailed. Pony, ponytailed, chubby-cheeked mm. American, moved over to Europe onto Mark Maddio's team, and mm-hmm. Mark is not known for his love of things that aren't French. <laughs> and Chris Horner stated at the time he got very homesick and essentially cut his losses and left. Went back to ride on the US circuit for, I think, between 1999, he rode for Mercury. Mm. Between 2000 and 2005, when he signed for Sonia Duval, he was riding on the American circuit, doing well at races American races. Races that don't suit him, though. D- races that aren't Yeah, really quite, quite true. He, he had some good showings in the Tour of Georgia, um, which doesn't exist anymore, which was a chance for him to race on home soil. But he took an unusual route, and he was already towards his 30s by the time he even became a proper... Mm. European professional, so his, his career template's been very unusual, I'd say unique. And there has obviously been a lot of suspicion, scepticism around his performances, as, as, as you'd expect in a, in a Grand Tour. You know, we had it to some extent at the, at the Giro, where Nibali was so dominant, and we had it in particular at the Tour with, with Chris Froome. Uh, it, it comes with the territory now, of course. Uh, but Horner, I, the, the suspicion seems to be based mainly around his age. Also his performance, but the, the, the problem is that we're in the situation where anybody who does anything in cycling, you know, anything who win, almost anybody who wins a race has their finger of suspicion points at them, and we're, we're starting to get into the arena of um, performance-based suspicion. Um, we can't accuse the winners of races of being on, being on drugs. It's just it's, that's, that's unscientific, and it's not strong enough evidence. What he did the other day when he dropped 
Nibali, Valverde and Rodriguez, three of, three of the better climbers in the world. Um, it did look slightly unusual, purely because he, he put the thick end of a minute. Put so much time into them. In, into quickly, them. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, Nibali doesn't look as sharp as he did at the Giro. Valverde doesn't look sharp. He's, he's actually being dropped when the accelerations happen. And Rodriguez has just come out of a podium finish at the Tour de France. And maybe they're not riding at the same level now. So for Horner to win races is not suspicious. For him to win by as much as he did, maybe moving towards you know, a situation where we, where we need to ask questions. But Horner's the man to answer those questions. He is, and he gave a, an interview yesterday to, to our friend Andy Hood of, of Velo News. Didn't, do a, didn't seem to do a press conference, but Andy Hood caught up with him on the phone. I have to say, it wasn't the most uh, satisfactory of, of interviews. Um, Horner said he was aware of the suspicion and scepticism out there on Twitter and forums and so on, um, and he chose not to, not to really respond to it. Um, he didn't. It wasn't as convincing a defence as we've perhaps seen from other riders. No, we, we know from, from history that not responding to these things is not, not the correct way of going things. We had 20 years of not responding to it, and it... You know, yeah, he said, I mean, he said he was aware of it. He said he was aware of it. And he's right in the sense that it's probably very, very difficult to respond to. He's not going to satisfy everybody. I think he has got some questions to answer about things that he's said before. Um, particularly when he's been on, on teams of, of Lance Armstrong and, and Johan Bernal uh, and previous defence of, of uh, Lance Armstrong. He's not unique in that sense. A lot of riders have um, said things over the years for various reasons. It's not in itself any indication of guilt or otherwise. But you're right, Ed. I think that the whole, um, this whole uh, idea of, of performance-based suspicion is, is incredibly harmful. It, it's inevitable, natural. Um, as well, but it's incredibly damaging, incredibly harmful, um, and we need more. We need what we need is is faith that anti-doping is doing its job, and I like to think that it is uh, it is doing a, certainly a better job than it's done well, in previous years. Rem remember that the the only way to sanction a rider is by a, a positive test, whether it's a analytical positive, as most are, or non-analytical. Not necessarily. Right. I mean, I mean, Armstrong was was eventually caught was without an analytical a non -analytic, test. Yeah, yeah. As, yeah. as in the case of Armstrong, yeah. it was a non-analytic. Yeah. Non so it's it's the anti-doping which needs to mm. catch these people. I, I don't think a journalist asking Horner if he's doping is going to be the right way Elicit to do it. Because, he's, because, of course, what, what's he going to say? Mm. That's, 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 that's not going to happen. not to say no. Um, the other story today is uh, Fabian Cancellara, Horner's teammate, who won the time trial pretty convincingly ahead of Tony Martin. Those two will probably be battling it out for the World Time Trial Championship um, in a couple of weeks. Cancellara looks like he's come right back into form. Yeah, he does. Um, he missed the Tour de France this year for the yeah. first time. Was, but the, the first week not being suited to him so so well with no, no prologue and a series of hilly stages meant that, and very few time trialling kilometres um, for him meant that he... He missed the tour, and he's he seems to have embarked on a training program, which has it's it's made him a bit more lean. He looks slightly less chunky than he has in the past, and he's riding very well on the hills. I mean, there was a hill in the time trial. He's obviously got very good form, and he's not had you know, the Tour de France a very mm. big distraction. He's not had the distraction of having had to do the Tour de France to interrupt his preparation. I'd, I'd say he's moving towards the World Championships in very, very good form, I'd say, in both, perhaps, the, yeah, for both the, the time trial and the road race. The, I'd the say road he's race, be he's won the time trial what, four times now, or yeah. something. so the, the road race is the one he definitely wants, he, he's desperate to win that, and it is interesting, there was a climb today, and the, the course in Florence, the time trial course a, is... Cancellar is quite handy up shorter climbs, mm. he's, he's, he's been able to escape the Tour de France palace on, on short, sharp climbs, before he's he's no mountain goat, but I think the world's road race is unfinished business. For Different him. kind of race, isn't but, it? Uh, his problem is he's so he's so bad at not telegraphing his obvious good form that once again I can see him being marked out of the race and getting the silver medal. He, he needs if he's going to win it, he probably needs to win it alone, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Although he's he's quite handy. He in did a win sprint, a sprint in the Pyro Bay this year, didn't the, he? The kind of people who can get to the finish with Cancellara tend to be the kind of people who can out-sprint him as well. Mm. Um, he doesn't want to be at the finish with someone like even Gilbert's not shown great form, but mm. Gilbert's quite nippy in a sprint faster than Cancellar, most probably. So, yeah, Cancellar has to win alone. Mm. Um, whether he can do that or not is, you know, it, it depends on the race and 
how closely he's marked. Mm. But yeah, I'll say he's one of the strong favourites. There's um, another week and a bit of the Vuelta go. No more time trials. It's a very, you know, as I've said, a very mountainous uh, final week. Um, I think perhaps only one flat stage. So, uh, who are you? Uh, Domenico Pozzovivo was a, a brilliant performance today in the time trial. He's sort of sliding up the overall. I think Nibali's got to be the, the favourite still, but who do you fancy for it? Uh, Nibali, definitely. I think... We're guilty of treating Grand Tours with a shorter attention span than we might do. Remember, the race is only eight days old. This is this is one thing about the Horner discussion that was quite premature. He's, it, won, he's won two stages. He yeah, could still fall he, away. And and you can see. I think it's plain that Nibali is not sharp yet, and he, I think he'll come into form in the final week. And the final the final ten days are brutal. Mm. Um, you know, Horner could end up losing. Five, five minute, he could have shot it, shot his bolt. Or he and could I, finish, I think, still finish on the podium. Oh, ab- absolutely, possible. anything, anything, anything is possible. And what what I like about cycling is still, I don't really know what's going to happen, and that's mm. what you know. I, I don't think we're, we're we're not meant to know what's going to happen in the final weeks of the Vuelta. That's that's why we watch it. Um, so I think my 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 podium still remains Nibali, Rodriguez, and maybe Valverde grinding round mm. to third place. And also, I- Ivan Basso looks like. He's going to be good for the top, top yeah. five. Yeah, Bass was right back not, in form. Not sparkling, but he's never been that sparkling a rider. But he's grinding his way round and not getting dropped that easily. So this him, is the best I've seen Bass look for a couple of years. Actually, uh, yeah, since since he yeah. since, even since he last won the Giro. Well, yeah, I'd yeah, say. yeah. Um, But I, th- I think Nibali's the favourite. He's very experienced. He's won two Grand Tours, and Horner has not been in this position before. And I, I think we've probably seen the best of Horner. I'll be surprised if um, he can put any more performance. He's talking about riding for another two years. Really? As a pro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, extraordinary. Yep, good luck to him. But we did have a, there was a little discussion flared up on, on the whole business of riders riding for longer. And if you think about the human body, life expectancy increasing, I mentioned on Twitter that I read an article recently about human fertility increasing, women being fertile for longer. Now, you would think that... Um, that would have some effect on athletic performance as well, and that we may well see start to see a trend whereby riders are able to keep going, certainly in, at a high level into the late 30s. I think we're seeing that already um, to some extent, although the stats are don't perhaps back well, that up so I mean, well. The, the thing, I mean, the, 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 the problem with the stats is there's such a broad range of cyclists that the average is invariably somewhere, somewhere in the middle. That's, yeah. that's normal. But... Could Evans won the tour when he was, what, 33, 32, 33, 34? Uh, Bradley Wiggins was in his early 30s as well when he won the tour. Chris Froome's not, not that old. But when, when you look back and think that Bernardino retired at the age of 32, and 30, you know, 32 used to be seen as the kind of cut-off mark, it's clear that's no longer, mm. you know, it's, it's no longer the cut-off mark. Rides are riding into their mid-30s. So you might expect that there would be some outliers riding very well into their late 30s um, because... Not just because of you know, human health being better and life expectancy being longer, but the fact that coaches know a lot more about cycling, rest and recovery than they used to. And riders look after themselves much more than they used to. They race fewer days than they used to. They look after themselves more. So why wouldn't they be able to... No, I think, it's, I think the, the, the limiting factor is desire, uh, as ever. And I think that will be the... You know, somebody like David Miller, for example, still riding at a very high level, but he's really ready to, to, to finish next year because he's, he's had enough. Well, again, with, with Chris Horner, he is old, but then again, he's only been racing in Europe for yeah. eight, se- eight, eight seasons, yeah. I think it is, so since 2006. So he might as well be 28. Um, ex- exactly. That means he, he's not going to be as jaded as somebody who turned pro at the age of 22 and has been grinding around for 13 years. Mm. No, it follows, absolutely. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Powered by Sharp. So, Ed, I mentioned earlier on that we, uh, we've we got this little interview with Graeme O'Brien, uh, who you interviewed, obviously, for your excellent book, The Race Against Time, about the uh, battle between O'Brien and Boardman back in the 1990s for supremacy, particularly with our record, but also the pursuit, of course. Now, O'Brien, let's talk about him first. How did you find him? Don't say by getting a train up to Glasgow. <laughs> that's, then, that's and then, that's and also, and that's then another covered, train to Salt Also covered in the book. He's great company. Graham O'Brien is an engaging, talkative, interesting man. He was generous almost to a fault, really. He, he, he met me in Saltcoats, where he was living at the time, on the, uh, on the west coast of Scotland. And 
you know, my dictaphone was still on six, seven hours later. Then we went for went for supper. He he was really hospitable and really happy to happy to talk. Um, it's, a great, it's a great story in your book about him encountering a, a local beggar. I don't think Ronnie's a beggar. He's um, oh, is he not? One of the one of the local local characters um, in Saltcoats. I have no idea whether he's still there now. But when when we were walking back through Saltcoats um, after after the interview, we were on our way to the pub, um, we we bumped into a bunch of guys sitting outside a closed down cinema in in Saltcoats, and they they kind of called Graham over, and they they knew him, they 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 chatted. What struck me about Obrey's interaction with these these guys. These these guys were you know, the local down and out, so kind of dog on a string, mm. hanging around on the street corners all day long. Um, Obrey was very comfortable with these people. He, he engaged them in conversation. They they knew him and, and he he knew them. And um, what struck me was that there was a contrast between the way he's lived his life, where he is a very engaging individual, but he's also He's like a Rolling Stone. He doesn't. He doesn't gather any moss. He, he he doesn't gather friends. He 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 has associations with people, and then they kind of fall by the wayside. And he moves on. He's he's very solitary in his path through life. Um, he was very at home with these people who also, you know, their their, their path through life is different from most people. I think he identifies, doesn't he, with. Um those who are uh, apart from society. He's, he sees himself as somebody who's um, a, a loner, a, a freelancer. Yeah, um, he's an outsider. He, an outsider, He, 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 re he really is. And when you, when you, it's, it's no surprise he got into time trialling in Scotland because you know, this cycling you know, back in the late 80s mm. and 90s was a, was a niche sport. Um, Scotland, the Scottish scene was a bit off the beaten track compared to Apologies to you for saying this. I don't know what you're getting at here. <laughs> Compared to the uh, English scene, mm. uh, English and Welsh scene, or even the rest of the British scene. Um, and then he was in Ayrshire, which was seen as a kind of eccentric offshoot of Scottish cycling. So he's, he's an outsider and an outsider and an outsider. Ayrshire roots. Um, this explains a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, Aubrey, you know, I, I, I've known him for a long time from those, those days, really, when he was this eccentric guy bowling up and down dual carriageways on the bike with upturned handlebars like a position like a downhill skier. Um, and, and, you know, there, there have various, been various incidents over the years. I, I do remember, and he always brings this up, actually, I do remember being in a nightclub with him in Troon on the west coast of Scotland after the Scottish cycling dinner one year. And um, he uh, decided to get up on the table and start dancing. And anybody who didn't join him was accused of being wishy-washy. Oh, and, yes. And so I was wishy-washy. There was another event we did a, a couple of years ago in Edinburgh where... Uh, Graham was the, the, the special guest and he came along and uh, he was sort of talking about, about his film and so on. And uh, some one of my friends came into the cinema and said, is Graham O'Brien here yet? I said, I don't think he is. He says, oh, there's a guy that looks really like him eating a fish supper on the steps outside. <laughs> and lo and behold, it was it was Graham. Uh, so he's, he's great company. As I mentioned earlier, I spoke to him yesterday. He's about to head off to the US to uh, attempt uh, to break the world land speed record. He's had a bit of a troubled build-up to this. This is a, an effort that has been well documented on humansinvent.com. There are a lot of uh, articles going all the way back to the, the origins of this attempt and the origins of Aubrey's efforts to build the beastie, the machine uh, in which he will... It's, it's not really correct to call it a bike. It's a, a machine in which he will attempt to break the world land speed record. Now, his original aim was to, to go for 100 miles an hour. That's no longer realistic, as he explains. But uh, he's still going there excited and, and you know, full of anticipation, and he'll certainly give it his best shot. I think there's a, there's a crucial difference between this effort and his, some of his earlier efforts early in his career, which, uh, when there was slightly more at stake for him emotionally, as he puts it. But here's Graham O'Brien. Graham, uh, you leave for the US this week. Are, are you feeling confident? I'm feeling confident that I've done what I can in terms of alterations. I've done what I can in terms of fitness within the realms of awards that's quite impeded this year with the major surgery. In fact, I can't say too much about it because litigation and stuff will probably follow. But it was actually a culminated vascular surgery. It was a month off and then complications another three weeks off. So it's not just a time off physically, it's a time off from actually getting testing done for the bike. So I'm twice up the airport and to test it out. So we found out quite a lot of those two sessions and the last one being relatively recently because of the delays and there's been uh, quite considerable alterations done which then there was no time to test. I had to go in the box to America. So it seemed okay propped up and actually permanent statically. 
So she didn't say things right on the road, but I'm not going to go to the Box of America. So, but I'm reasonably confident those alterations is going to be good. And I'm reasonably confident my form has improved. That's not as good as it could be with the setbacks, but I read a reasonably, reasonably good punt out. So, and you go to America and, and punt up that road. So the bike's on, on route. I mean, riding it, do you feel confident that it, it can go at the, the speed that you need to go at? Which is, you're aiming for 100 miles an hour, aren't you? Are you, are you confident that... No, it, uh, no, 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 100 miles an hour was... Um, the original. That was a bike team number, which I do believe a human being the perfect condition, perfect aerodynamics, perfect uh, drive system, perfect air and, and atmospheric conditions on, on doing the physics on it. The other people that have done the physics on it, maths and physics people... The record with the watches that somebody could put out and the maths, the physics, the air diet potential. The issue in being some time could do 100 miles an hour, mm. but it's not going to be me. What's your target then? My target is to, um, it's gear, I've, I've actually read gear that I was mega over geared thinking, I wonder if that could be the 100 mile an hour person. But realistically, uh, with the setbacks, the alterations and everything not being perfect, the world record itself is 82.9 mile an hour. The British record stands at 60 something. Jason clearly went out with a Formula One built bike on his Olympic form and did 64 mile an hour, which shows you how, how difficult it is. I think the British record was improved a few miles an hour since the late 60s or something like that. If I can get to that and then try and sprint up as much as I can towards towards world record pace, then I'm just waiting to see what happens. How, how are you feeling about it? I mean, how does this compare to going out to Norway to try and set the world hour record? Can you compare it? Well, going out to Norway was a, I actually had to, for my emotional survival, do that mm. thing. Secondly, when I went to Norway, I knew exactly what pace on the exact bike that I was doing up down the dual carriageway. I knew exactly what I would, could make myself do on the track with those conditions. I goes, right, I'm having that. And that's all measured and controlled. I know that's a time trial. And this occasion, really I don't know, because there's so much more about the bike than what it is about the rider, because the graph goes, if you go power against velocity, it goes up. It kind of exits up and up and up and up and it's steeper, steeper, steeper. So it kind of hits a curve and it goes whoosh exponentially up. So somewhere in that curve it go really goes exponentially up uh, into the heavens of power output to speed. Then somewhere in that curve is kind of where you lie with the potential of the bike. So a lot of ways it's dictated by what the bike's capable of, but you don't know what it is. But you're you're feeling more relaxed about it, I guess, than you did back then. This is this well, is more. I feel more relaxed about it because it, it's almost. It's almost like your lucky bag is what's in your lucky bag is in your lucky bag and you go to America and open it and you can't change what's in your lucky bag. It's kind of whatever speed speed you're gonna go at, it's kinda of dictated the way that curve is and if nothing goes wrong and you, and, and you steer good and you pedal good and you good, obviously take it to your maximum potential, but it's kind of that potential is kind of set by what the bike is. So how how would you describe your mood? Are you are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you apprehensive? I'm so excited about get out to America and doing it. I wish I'm apprehensive to think I might walk away thinking, oh my God, I could have done better or steered better or pedal better. Or... So there's all these factors thinking about all at the same time and there's no, there's been no practice time for me because of the, the illness that I've had. Mm. It's, a com- so, it's a compromised a- attempt. It's compromised, but I, I feel, I'm confident that I've done the mechanicals okay that it's going to run good. There's always that wee crash in the background and also you don't know the potential. Are you confident in, in, in the bike as well in terms of your safety? This sport is, I mean, it's not the tiddly thing, so yeah, I've rattled along in a kind of torpedo type arrangement, like reasonably high speeds, but that's kind of the nature of the sport. Mm. But, I mean, obviously, make it as safe as you can do, with no point of bits and, and, and any chain wheels kind of covered if you can, and then so that if you're out about, you're not going to get chopped up and stuff. But every year, there's some team or two ends that go going sideways along the road, that's the inevitable thing of, of because it catches so much aerodynamic turbulence and stuff like that, and flipping over kind of kind of goes with the territory. Well, Graham, good luck. We're, we're going to speak to you when you get back as well. So very best of luck with the with the effort. Well, that is good luck, but no bad luck. <laughs> both, both. And uh, I'll give it large. And uh, if I'm lucky to go, you know what, that's the best I could have done. And that's the bike, the best I could build it in my pal's workshop and my, my kitchen. And, and I've kind of built this whole bike on my own. Somebody's late at night making dust and everything. I think they were okay, that's a good thing I could do under that. Kind of, it's almost like an indie. And we take away the motor race and I realised I, I envisioned this team thing and it was all, we were all big te- a team and, and we work together and it'll be, and it'll be like a team effort. But it turns out me making dust in the night and it's, I realised this is kind of indie type arrangement. So 
Well, you've, all, you've always been indie, yeah. Graham. You've always been indie. That's that's the end up. I've been mean, I don't know why I thought it would be anything. But um, anyway, it's, uh, the bike's there waiting, so let's get it large. The Cycling Podcast with humansinvents.com. Innovation, craftsmanship and design. So that was Graham O'Brien. As I mentioned, there's a lot of stuff on the humansinvent.com website documenting that effort, going right back to the beginning, and lots of pictures of the beastie, um, as the bike is called, um, bowling up and down uh, airport runways in Scotland. Uh, he got up to 50 miles an hour at one point. But it's fascinating stuff and well worth a read ahead of his his attempt. Ed, you went to his flat in Salt Coast. He actually now lives in Kilmarnock. He, he's, yes, he's, he's, bought, he's bought a house there. He bought a house on the internet, having never seen it, and so he's moved there. Now, when I phoned him, he actually, uh, the line wasn't great. It was a, a mobile phone, so apologies for that. Um, when I pointed that out to him, he did offer to run down to his corner shop and buy a phone, which was very generous and rather typical of Brie. Yep, typical. Did, t- you, t- did you see the beastie when you were there? Uh, no, I saw that the... Funnily enough, I saw the kitchen table upon which it was designed, and, and the kitchen table at, in Graham Overy's house is, it's fair to say that's where he runs his office from, so there's, there are piles of papers and, and old cards like that. I saw his British Cycling Life membership card sitting there, which was quite funny because he was always very much on the outside of British mm. Cycling. He wasn't an establishment man, but he's got life membership of, of, of BC. And A life sentence. On, on <laughs> life, life, <laughs> life membership. On the table, you can see the pencil lines where he's drawn out the, um, the shape of the beastie and mm. obviously done the, maybe the angles and the welding. There's a, there's a, a vice attempt, attached to the edge of the table. So even though the beastie... This will be there, the table he eats off as well, uh, just it, it, around the It vice. could well be, but I, I, can, I can say that he does make a very good cup of tea mm. on, the, on his kitchen table. Um, but then, and interestingly enough, in his front... We, we sat in the kitchen rather than the front room because the front room, it's fair to say there was a mountain of bike parts and bits and there was probably enough to build six or seven separate bikes from the parts on the living room floor but there's you know there's there's half built bikes and bits of bikes and bikes which you think look like some kind of special design he's always working on things always building bikes it's he's uh, unique in the sense that he is both brilliant athlete and brilliant innovator and inventor and it's very rare to get somebody who excels in in both fields isn't it yeah, it is. It's, 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 it, it's more common to find people who are good at, good at one thing but not, not both, and a lot more common to find people who are mediocre in both. I, um, think, he, was, I think he would even suggest that he's stronger on invention and innovation than he is as an athlete, perhaps. I don't know. Yes, because without, without his innovation, there would be no yeah. way to express those physical talents. And remember, also, he's, he's, he was very strong psychologically. When you read the passages in his um, autobiography about his hour records, the lengths to which he drove himself were phenomenal, far beyond what normal humans can 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 do. So, very very unusual individual, and he was he was he was good at cycling because of the confluence of all these different different mm. things. But his his innovations were revolutionary. Is it, I mean, I was thinking about him again in regard to something we were talking about earlier: the the doping suspicion. You imagine if Graham O'Brien, unknown Graham O'Brien, came along now and broke the world our record, as he did in 1993. Exactly. The, uh, the, the, the allegations would, would, would be there, and that's, that's the tragedy of our sport at the moment. Is that and yet what comes through in your book very strongly is, is that Aubry is, 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 as far as any athlete can be, beyond suspicion. Uh, yeah, well, he, he, he spoke very, very, very convincingly, and that, 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 that doesn't mean he's clean. It just, just means he, he, he can speak very, very convincingly. But I also can't find a single person in British cycling in the British Cycling community, who will, who will point the finger at him? Well, he, I mean, famously as well, he he was very briefly involved in a, in a French professional team and and came home because he said he was offered to be part of their doping program. He also has countless stories of being offered or to, uh, being asked about drugs when he went to the continent. Italian riders coming up to him and asking him quite matter of factly, "What did you use for the hour record?" Um, but what's interesting is that again, in the context of this this question. Um, one of the comments that Dave Brailsford came out with at the Tour de France was that uh, he said at one, at one point in time, clean performances will surpass previous doped performances. And I thought about that in relation to Brie because we know that Francesco Moser, the holder of the hour record in 1984, was blood doped. He was he, blood doping. That's, that's, that's out there, we know that. He was also, you could say that the, the difference between them was the bike. Brie's bike was revolutionary. But so was so Francesco was Moser's, Moser's um, and he was at altitude. Yep, and they, they laminated the track 
for Moza as well so to create less less rolling resistance. So he had everything in his favour, and Moza had the he had the disposable income and the sponsorship to to do all these things. So when Moza broke the hour record, he had a lot of advantages that Eddie Merckx, who had the record before him, didn't have. Um, the hour record's always, it's never been just a test of how good a cyclist are, it's a test of technology as well. Um, so different hour records aren't, aren't necessarily comparable, and, and like you said, with, with Moser, he was, he was blood doping. Um, Obi, which I which was allowed doping. at the time. Blood it, doping it was, it was legal. Well, it, it? Yeah, it wasn't illegal, was the, mm -hmm. is probably the, the, the best way of describing it. Um, he didn't admit this till years later, so he must have felt there was something dodgy about it. It was subsequently banned as well. Um, but yeah, Aubrey, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was clean. There's, there's absolutely nothing to make me think that he was. Um, I think it would, it, he was cheating. Yeah, there's, there's it would no, go against everything Aubrey was about. He was all about. It was, it was almost natural curiosity that drove him as well. The, the emphasis on natural. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me about the bookhead. It's a great. It's a really good read. Lots of great research in it. It's another little sort of micro story about British cycling as well but it's obviously a world cycling story of Brian Boardman throughout the 90s were really put the hour record back on the on the map back on the agenda do you think this was the golden period for the hour record um, well definitely the hour record was swapped between them um, I think for sev several times mm. also the world pursuit championship what attracted me to this story was, uh, was, was was several different things the initial attraction was purely the sporting rivalry between Obrey and Boardman. Um, I think they needed, needed each other for their story to become more interesting and the, the fact that they were quite different in character but good at the same thing meant that it was natural for people to choose sides and to, to support one and that, that feeds the story, that feeds the rivalry. I think great athletes gain, gain from having a credible, credible rival. So Boardman and Obi's rivalry was the first thing that attracted me to the story. Their rivalry also took place against a backdrop of incredible technological change in cycling. Um, when Boardman and Obi started out, no one was even using tri-bars. People rode time trials essentially on road bikes with, maybe they'd have a bit of concession to mm. aerodynamics with cow horn hand handlebars or, or drilled out bits to save weight. But when they finished their careers, we were fully into the age of carbon fibre and, and moulded frames, and this all happened during their careers, and both, both riders were instrumental in the aerodynamic leaps forward that cycling made um, in the early 1990s. Yeah, and they were such different personalities, which again is, is, was a very appealing thing about the rivalry, or they looked to be different personalities, and th this is an interesting aspect of it, I think. You know, you had a breed training, building bikes in his workshop, training in his, in his garage, using old parts of washing machines. And you had Chris Boardman with a team of scientists and managers and training in labs and Peter Keane testing his blood lactate and all this kind of stuff. So they appeared to be complete opposites. And as time has gone on, I've wondered about that because Absolutely. Boardman is, is pretty, actually pretty quirky himself. A couple, a couple of years ago, I remember him saying that he fancied... Um, living in a in a hut on the west coast of Scotland or living in a small cottage up the west coast of Scotland and I said if 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 you'd said you know that one of these two athletes would say that in the 1990s who would be Graham O'Brien or Chris Boardman you'd say Graham O'Brien um, and I think they probably had more in common um, than than we realised at the time they did they're both very innovative and that's what they had in common and Boardman the way Boardman described it when I interviewed him for the book was that they, they, they end up, ended up at the same place via different paths. Um, but neither trained in a traditional sense. The traditional cycling training back in the, back in the day was, in, in the late 80s, was lots of miles, ride, ride lots, race lots, and you get fit. Keane and Boardman turned this on its head. They, Peter Keane. Peter, Peter, Peter Keane, yeah, yeah. I, I apologise. P Peter Keane and Chris Boardman um, realised that that it was desirable to do as little training as possible to, in order to, to rest more and do very specific training. So Boardman was, when Boardman was setting national 25-hour records and, and winning national Top championships, mile, 25 mile. and 25 mile, and <laughs> he was, um, he was, he was doing 12 hours training a week, which was unheard of. Now Obi, on the other hand, um, people told me uh, Vic Haynes, who's Graham Obi's um, manager for his first hour record, told me that Obi's training would sometimes consist of, during a typical week, he'd get on the turbo trainer and blast himself for an hour 
and get off, and that was it for another, and then take two days off, and then two days, three days later, ride as hard as he could for an hour, and he'd say, well, I'm training for the hour record. So, although that sounds a bit quirky and unscientific, I bet that if you examined the efforts that Baldwin was doing in training, and the efforts that Obi was doing in training, they'd actually be very similar, and both were doing specific training before specific training was fashionable. But Boardman was looking at his pulse monitor and Brie was listening to his body. Ex- exactly. I imagine that, that, that an that, awful that lot of people same. wouldn't have the ability, the capacity to listen to their body in the way that Brie seemed to be in tune with, with exactly what he was capable of and what would be optimum for him on any given day. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, the, the, the criticism of, of Team Sky in the last couple of years has been that they ride to, ride to pulse rates, but you, ha- yeah, you have power, to know, yeah. or power out, but you, you have to know your body well enough to be able to do that. I think Boardman knew his body well enough that he wouldn't have needed needed a, a power output or pulse rate monitor. Um, when he rode the, um, I think the World Pursuit Championships, when he broke the world record and beat Colin Ellie in the final, I, I think he was, he rode, apart from the first kilometre where the acceleration up to speed skews the figure somewhat, he rode the subsequent three kilometres in times which were within hundredths of a second of each other. So Boardman knew his body as well. Obi was the same, he, he listened to what he knew he could do and then just pushed himself. So what was the biggest surprise for you in writing this book? Um, the biggest surprise was that Boardman turned to be more like Obrey than I realised, and mm. Obrey turned out to be more like Boardman. <laughs> the, 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 the image I had at the start was that it was the, the wacky artist versus the, the square scientist, Obrey being the artist and Boardman being the scientist. And when I was a cycling fan back in the 80s, I, I gravitated towards Obrey. I, I, I thought he was much more emotionally compelling character than Boardman, who I, th- I felt was a bit of a cold, cold fish. But in the course of my interviews, and it was the interview I did with Peter Keane which brought this home to me, um, Chris Boardman's life was on the edge of chaos through the, through the 1990s. He, he, he started having children at the age of 20. Um, he had, and didn't really stop. And didn't really stop. He had six kids, and he wasn't able to go over to France and do the typical continental apprenticeship, so he had to invent a new way of becoming a professional. And, Keane says that they didn't really know what they were doing. It looked like they knew what they were doing because they were photographed in in labs with all these numbers and Mm. and graphs and clipboards and oxygen measuring devices and they didn't have a clue. They were making it up as they went along. And Obrey, on the other hand, was much more scientific and rigorous about his approach to innovation with his bike, with technology and aerodynamics. He, he did a lot of reading, didn't he, about he physiology, did, he, he biology. He'd read up about it yeah. and, and aerodynamics, and he didn't guess that that position was better. He worked it out, and, mm. and it was just his ability to look at it afresh and, and work out what the what the what what was causing more aerodynamic drag, drag with his bike, and he, he got rid of it. So he's actually a more, a more conscious thinker than, than we give him credit for. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. For more articles, go to humansinvent.com slash cycling. Okay, welcome back to the final part of the humansinvent.com podcast. We're going to go again to our record in a second or two and talk about the future for that event. I also want to mention that on the Humans Invent Vimeo channel, you'll find uh, the inside story of stage nine of this year's Tour de France, which was won, of course, by Dan Martin after a a very uh, kind of organised team effort and it uh, features interviews with uh, David Miller, uh, Charlie Wigelius, Jonathan Vauters and others, uh, all the members of the team who were involved in that. It's a really fascinating insight. Um, we've also got a competition which I'll uh, mention at the end. But Ed, while you're here, the hour record, um, there's been talk again recently of renewed attempts at that. It's been on the shelf for a while. Uh, Bradley Wiggins has mentioned it. Uh, Fabian Cancellara has mentioned it or had it mentioned about him but there's a lot of confusion about it can you tell us exactly where it, where it's at at the moment um, where it's at the hour record there are, there are two hour records and there's, there's actually a third third hour record which we can we can we can mention briefly that I'll, I'll get that one out of the way first the somebody's I think the record's currently 90, 90 or 91 kilometers on a recumbent mm. bike that's the recumbent hour record. that's that's as fast as anybody's probably going to go on a bike. Um, over an hour. But the, the other two records are where it gets complicated because um, the record we've been talking about with Obrey and Moser, um, that developed until the 1996 when Chris Boardman rode 56.375 kilometres in an hour at Manchester Velodrome and, and pretty much put the, put the record on the shelf. Um, but that, at that point, the, the UCI 
um, decided that they were going to split the record into two, into Broadman's 56 kilometres, which was the absolute hour record, and then they were going to reset the original hour record um, and make it so that you couldn't use tri bars and a whole. On a pretty much on a standard road on, bike. On a standard the road Mer bike. The, on, on the Merck bike was the model, wasn't yeah, it? The, the, the Merck's bike was actually <laughs> quite technologically advanced, but the shape of it was very, very, mm. very traditional. So Boardman went back and said in, in 2000, his last hurrah as a professional cyclist was to reset the hour record to 14, just under 49 and a half kilometres um, on on a bike which was you know with drop handlebars, not even tri bars. So. Um, that's only been broken one time since by Andre Sosenka, uh, who, who went on to test positive some years, some years later, um, who set the record 49.7 kilometres um, a, few, a few years back. So that's where it stands at the moment. Now, if Wiggins and Kanslar have to go for the record, they, they're, they're not going to ride 56 kilometres. Um, Boardman did that in the Superman position. I, I don't think anyone's ever going to be able to ride a, a record like that ever again. They're going to have to go for Merckx's record, and that means um, training and then race subsequently racing for an hour in that position. Very, very hard to do. Very hard to do. Interestingly, Brian Cookson's, uh, who's obviously standing for UCI president against Pat McQuaid, uh, his latest sort of manifesto uh, as regards rules and regulations. Um, he talks about equipment. He talks about taking some of the shackles off the manufacturers and looking again at this issue of what's allowed in professional racing um, you know the development of the bicycle has been sort of held back deliberately by the UCI who want to keep the, the road bike the road racing bike as the traditional diamond shaped model with two equal sized wheels drop handlebars no kind of extensions or anything on the bars for road race interesting that he brought that up as a um, as a possibility, some people will balk at that. Others, in particular, the manufacturers will welcome it. Yeah, it, it, it definitely needs to be looked at because all the hour records, right from the very start, um, it hasn't just been about the athletes; it's been about the technology that they've harnessed, and it, it can go too far. Um, I, th I think. I think even even O'Brien admits, you know, I don't, I don't think. I remember once asking him whether he would have liked to have seen everybody riding around on the. The original kind of abris, the, the old faithful position with the upturned bars and downhill skier type position, and he said no. He th he thinks that USA actually did the right thing. Yeah, it's it's interesting. My 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 opinion is that they should, in order to keep the hour record relevant, they need to allow tri bars for it in this to to the same measurements as they do time trials on the road. And the reason is that the hour record has always been the the blue ribbon comparison of the very greatest cy cyclist, a comparison across the ages. The, um, it, was, it was never possible for Fausto Coppi to race Merckx or for Onkatil at his peak to, at his peak to race Merckx or, or, or Moser, but it's, it's a chance for them to race each other at this distance and you know, harness a certain amount of technology to help them because training theory has evolved so much that what a modern rider would be doing compared yeah, to what Merckx was doing would, would, wouldn't, wouldn't be... A match wouldn't, against equals, it's, is it's, it? it's not the same. It's, it's, it's incomparable. So you have to allow for some, some development as time goes on. And I think the, the, the hour record has lain dormant since, since that flow of interest. And it's, it's because it's actually unfeasible for a professional rider to take enough time out to train himself to sit in that horrible position um, for an hour, when you'd never ride a road time trial with, with drop handlebars. I think they need to allow time trial handlebars, and then you, you'd get Kanslar and Wiggins and maybe to, Tony take, only, to well. take only two examples, mm. to have a go at it. And it'd be interesting. I think Kanslar and Wiggins would, could have a great rivalry if, you know, if they both went for it, because in terms of pure time trial class, Kanslar has got the edge on Wiggins, but Wiggins is a trackie, and it's when you ride the hour record, it's not a case of just turning up and riding around the track for now. You've got you've got to know how to measure your effort on the track. You, the way you ride a lap is it's not a flat rate of effort all the way around. Mm. You have to the way you ride the bend is different, and the g-forces that affect you, and it, it's 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 actually an acquired skill which would give Wiggins the edge. I, I think it would be a, a fantastic be great, sporting great story yeah. if if both were to announce a crack at it. I don't think they should do it simultaneously. Some of the idea is that they should do it simultaneously, but the point is that somebody breaks it and that creates the interest and somebody else goes. It's like Ovest and Co. 
swapping world records mm. in the early 80s. It's such a compelling story. It would be it great. Would re- reignite interest in a, in a very relevant record. I think Cashmere does actually ride on the track a bit. He always has done, and there's a new track being built near his home in Switzerland, um, which he'll be able to train on soon. Maybe Tony Martin was practicing for their record on the drop handlebars with, his, I mean, with his break last week. You could yeah. argue that we're in, a, we're in a golden age for time trials. We are. Right? Well, we're, we're looking Martin ahead to Wiggins. this world time trials as one of one of one of the greatest potentially. Yeah, it, it could be, and what, why not you know, exploit so, that fact? With, so, I'll put you put you on the spot here. Can, can, could they beat it at the forty nine point seven? Yes. Yes, both of them capable yeah, of beating it. But I don't. I don't. It won't be easy, and I don't think they'll beat it by much unless mm. they relent on the rules and allow tri bars. In which case, fifty kilometres will be feasible. So please uh, feel free to contribute to this our record debate. What do you think? If you could tweet at humans invent hashtag our record, tell us what you think about our record, and we'll maybe read out some responses next week. So finally, competition. We've got two signed copies of Charlie Wigelius's brilliant book Domestique. I asked Charlie for a, a question, and he suggested who was the most handsome and charming Finno Brit to race between 2000 and 2011. I felt that was too challenging for people. It's a broad field. So I'm going to ask a different question. How many times did Charlie ride the Giro d'Italia? How many times did Charlie ride the Giro d'Italia? It won't be the first two winners because you'll all listen to this at different times. But we'll we'll pick a couple of winners out of the hat, and you'll win one copy each of Domestique. Please, again, tweet your answer to at humans invent hashtag Wigelius competition. And there's a test in there, if you can spell Wigelius right as well. So that's about it for, for today. Um, thank you very much, Ed Pickering, for thank joining you. us. Thank you for having me. I, I hope you'll uh, join us again. I hope even, so too. even if you are in the sticks now. Exodus is not the sticks. Sorry. After your earlier disparaging <laughs> comments about Scotland, I had to get my revenge in. We're the Scotland of England, Dan, and the rest of the <laughs> as, as I mentioned, uh, Daniel Freeb is preparing for returning, limbering up as we speak, doing some stretching exercises, maybe some yoga. And Lionel Burney will be back from Mauritius next week. So, so Lionel's La- 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 coming back from holiday and Daniel's coming back from the he's been, experience of writing a book. He's been writing a book and we'll, we'll hopefully hear all about that. This weekend I'm off to Ghent, actually, to watch Mark Cavendish's return to the track. I think it's the first time he'll be racing on the track since the Beijing Olympics. So he's taking part in a meeting in Ghent over Friday and Saturday, hoping to speak to him there, and we'll have some uh, some audio from him for next week's podcast and from other people as well. So hopefully you can listen then. Thank you very much for listening today. Listener.